Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's GI Community Fireside Chat. On behalf of Commonwealth Diagnostics International, we're excited to host today's discussion and Q&A on irritable bowel syndrome in honor of IBS Awareness Month. IBS affects an estimated 10 to 15 percent of the worldwide population, with up to 45 million people living with this functional GI disorder daily. It's one of the most burdensome chronic ailments reported by GI patients. And in a survey by IFFGD, nearly 2,000 patients reported that they suffered from IBS symptoms for 6.6 years before being diagnosed. Here with us today to discuss IBS and some of the latest diagnostic and treatment topics is our special guest, Dr. Shanti Eswaran, a gastroenterologist at Michigan Medicine and clinical associate professor of internal medicine at University of Michigan's School of Medicine. Dr. Eswaran has a research interest in the role of diet and food in functional bowel diseases such as IBS. Complemented by her clinical interests in functional GI diseases, celiac disease, and non-celiac gluten sensitivity. She was named a Rome Foundation Fellow and currently serves on the food on the food and FGID's working team for Rome Foundation. And she has several grants supporting her research. Dr. S. Warren, it's great to have you here with us today. Um, thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. I'm excited to also honor um, the uh, IBS Awareness Month. Great. We're very glad to have you. Let's jump into it. I'd like to uh, start where I think there's been a lot of discussion lately in the GI community, and that's around kind of optimizing the management and care of patients with IBS generally. Um, I know the newly appointed division chief of gastroenterology at your institution at Michigan Medicine, Dr. Uh, William Shea, Bill Shea, recently even called IBS care a a team sport. Um, I'm wondering how you and your colleagues working together uh, are improving diagnostic and treatment strategy in 2022 for patients presenting with IBS symptoms and uh, you know maybe just any new innovative strategies or integrative strategies uh, with other multidisciplinary clinicians or the like that you might be uh, deploying in this post-COVID environment for IBS patients. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think you bring up a really good point um, about how multidisciplinary and integrative um, the care for IBS uh, is and and can and should be. Um, You know, irritable bowel syndrome is such a heterogeneous disease and condition. Um, It affects people a lot differently. So it can be either incredibly mild or incredibly debilitating um, and anywhere in between. Um, Patients can have a predominant um, symptom of, you know, changing their bowels or pain or bloating. Um, and that's all under the same umbrella um, of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and because the disease is so heterogeneous, the treatment strategy is really quite varied um, and can um, change so much between patient to patient and also um, within one's own journey um, through IBS. So what works um, for someone when they first are diagnosed with the condition um, may not work as well um, as their symptoms evolve and change. I mean, we're not really sure why that is um, and why we can't, um, you know, th- and, and, and because of that sort of variation, there's like one, um, there's no like one, one size fits all um, in, term of, in terms of how we treat irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and so that's why, you know, we kind of like use a lot of, you know, when, when me and a patient are sitting together in a clinic office, you know, I'm talking to them about a lot of their symptoms. I have to ask them, you know, what, what they think drives their symptoms. Is it stress and anxiety? Is it um, dietary changes? Um, Is it the other medications or other comorbidities that they have? Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of putting that into this, uh, into that context, putting their treatment plan um, into that context, then we can kind of like pull what, um, what we think is going to be the best option for them. Um, and that can all often involve cycling through um, a number of different treatment strategies um, to find, kind of figure out like what lands right with them. Um, and sometimes it's medication and pharmacologic treatment. Um, sometimes it's like a diet um, and specifically different types of diets for IBS. Um, and then sometimes it's usually, um, it can either be physical therapy um, and also behavioral therapy um, or psychology. Um, and so when we talk about, um, you know, IBS being like a team sport or kind of having this team approach, that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, and also, the, you know, of course, the patient's part of that team, too, um, and letting us know Absolutely. what it is and what's not working and like really what they have buy-in for. Yeah, you touched on so many important points. I'm really glad that you kind of started with the heterogeneity of 
the disease category just at large and, and generally speaking, but branching into the patient journey. One thing that we've learned at CDI over the years anyway, is in just in my personal and anecdotal conversations with clinicians around the country is that this patient population, the IBS patient population, but more generally just a functional GI patient population is a very disenfranchised group of patients. They're um, a very empowered group of patients. They want to determine what the root cause of their symptom set is. But the problem is that each case is very, very unique. So unless you have that multidisciplinary approach and you have a team of clinicians and you know, other medical providers that are willing to work cohesively to determine a treatment pathway for that one unique case, many, many times these patients are just finding themselves in a, a care conundrum that is, you know, 360 degrees, but they're getting back to square one and it's the same frustration with the same symptoms. So um, I know that your institution and your, your team at Michigan is, um, you know, in the driver's seat in, in this area and making sure that you're bringing in uh, you know, other integrated providers, dietitians, nutritional specialists, and, and the like to make sure that there's kind of a full approach to the IBS patient management, each unique case. And you know, these, these symptoms, IBS symptoms, they have an incredibly substantial impact on the quality of life of each and every one of these patients. They're often associated with eating food and, and certain trigger foods, as you you know, and again, your team is, is leading the research on. Um, there's also mounting evidence and support that dietary modifications as a primary treatment for IBS is, is kind of taking the main stage and really being able to take a more personalized and, and precision-based approach to some of these patient cases using foods or potentially elimination diets um, could make a lot of sense. So, I, and I'm just wondering, I know AGA, uh, recently received a, a clinical practice update on the role of, of IBS and, um, or, or I'm sorry, on the role of diet and IBS. And um, I'm just wondering specifically when it comes to diets and potentially elimination diets or, or other dietary modifications, um, any, any success or lack thereof that you may uh, or may not have seen as it, it comes to applying that to these IBS cases? Yeah, um, I think that, you know, meeting the patient where they are um, in terms of recommending dietary therapies is really, is really important. So you need to have a page. So I use diet a lot, um, in my treatment for irritable bowel syndrome of all subtypes, you know, um, you know, it, 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 you brought up diet as a treatment strategy and as a primary treatment strategy for IBS. And I think that it's really interesting because when I trained, um, like in the early 2000s, so I would say not that long ago, um, it's nothing we ever talked about in my fellowship training. Um, and so patients would say, oh, like, what do I eat? And I'm like, I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Um, because we just didn't understand, um, kind of like how food affected the GI, GI symptoms. Um, and it's really fascinating um, how quickly the field has grown, um, mm -hmm. both on the patient side, but uh, you know, also on the research side. And all of this, interestingly, I think has been primarily driven um, by patients asking. Um, because they, for years, they've been saying how food affects their symptoms. And you know, in the beginning, we would tell them, well, eat less of the things that bother you and eat more of the things that don't. Or you know, avoid extremes of uh, extremes of things. So avoid alcohol, extremes of alcohol, extremes of caffeine, extremes of fatty foods. But that's not, you know, that's that can be helpful to a point. Um, and so um, in the last, you know, 15 years or so, um, dietary strategy like the low FODMAP diet, um, like a gluten free diet, for example, um, have. Uh, you know, have kind of like taken, um, gotten to like the forefront, um, both in terms of patients mind, but also in a lot of, you know, gastroenterologists and even primary cares uh, practices. Um, but I really think that, you know, if we're talking about like which patients benefit from dietary treatment for their irritable bowel syndrome, um, it's really ideally prescribed to patients with IBS who have insight into their symptoms. And they yep. believe that what they're eating either the particular foods they're eating or just the meal itself um, will kind of like generate or worsen IBS symptoms. Um, and so um, those who are motivated to make the necessary changes are those that are gonna be, do the best with that strategy. So um, kind of to that, um, in that vein, 
Um, a patient who has that ins insight to their symptoms, I think is really uh, key um, when you're approaching and trying to figure out which treatment to offer a patient. Um, uh, it's also important to know who's not a good um, op who patient for this strategy. So for example, those um, who are at risk for malnutrition, um, those who are um, have a history of an eating disorder, for example, or disordered eating, um, not even necessarily something that's been diagnosed, but a history of disordered eating. Um, those with multiple comorbidities. So if you have very, very severe heart disease um, and you're not gonna be able, you're already on a restricted diet for that, for example, um, adding you know, another layer of restriction is not a good idea. Um, and also those who have food insecurity. Um, so people mm -hmm. who don't have a lot of um, uh, say over like, their food options on a day-to-day -day basis, or if they're living in a, you know, a group home setting or a retirement community where you're not have, don't have a lot of control, um, you know, spending a lot of time talking to those patients about whether or not a restricted diet um, is is going to be helpful for their IBS is is those aren't the patients like you know you, you don't talk to them most about that. Absolutely. Now, this is such an important area. I'm glad you touched on it because, you know, I've I've made the comparison before. Like it's it's one thing to remember to take a pill at seven o'clock every morning. It's another to make sure that each one of your meals, whether it's three or four a day or whatever it is, are prepped according to very specific guidelines are in compliance with the very specific diet that you're supposed to maintain protocol on for, you know, an extended period of time, a month, two months, whatever the case may be. Um, and that's often where I think patients can bear off course and, and find their symptoms creeping back into their daily life pretty quickly. So I'm just wondering, it sounds like you personally spend a, a pretty significant amount of your time individually with these patients determining, you know, who may be the best candidate to go on a specific diet and who may not. Um, and I think that, you know, just to your point completely based on, on uh, personal circumstances, there, there may be better candidates than others, but um, as just kind of a going matter, I'm wondering if patient compliance is something that uh, you found as a clinician to, to be a frustration to kind of your success rate, if you will, in, in treating these patients, um, or if you've kind of implemented or, if, uh, University of Michigan at large has implemented any, you know, kind of mitigation strategies, if you will, or, or um, assistance strategies to kind of help these patients or coach them along to uh, be able to maintain, say, a, you know, a FODMAP diet or FODMAP restricted diet for, you know, six weeks or whatever the case may be, because it's, it's a challenging yeah. thing to do. I myself have personally tried to do it. It's hard. It's tough. Yeah. So, you know, you mentioned the low FODMAP diet and that's, you know, currently the most evidence-based diet um, for IBS. Um, but, uh, and, and I'll go to, on to your other points in a minute, but there's other, you know, dietary options for irritable bowel syndrome. So soluble fiber, for example, um, is efficacious in treating global symptoms of IBS, um, patients who can't, or, you know, prefer not to undergo a full low FODMAP strategy. Um, there may be, um, kind of like a middle ground, um, that we can work with them about. And also there's like, we, like we mentioned before, you know, dietary treatment is not the only option. And so there's a whole litany of other treatments for irritable bowel syndrome that might be a better option for that patient. But in those that, you know, kind of choose to um, undergo like a restricted diet um, for your irritable bowel syndrome, um, you know, the use of a registered dietitian who has experience, um, not just in being a dietitian, but has experience with a low FODMAP diet and GI specific complaints is really, really key here. Huge. Um, because, yeah. you know, you mentioned how much time I spend. I don't have that much time compared to how the dietitians at time, or to be honest, the expertise, right. To of course, um, yeah. guide a patient, um, in their low FODMAP journey. Um, but also, you know, it, when you mentioned, um, adherence, I think it's important also to explain to the patient what that whole low FODMAP process will look like. Um, so, you know, in general, we talk to patients about um, the three phases of a low FODMAP diet. And when you, they just, when you explain that to them, sometimes like that whole um, FODMAP restriction doesn't seem so daunting. Um, so the first phase uh, we usually uh, discuss is called the elimination phase or restricted phase. Um, and during that phase, um, it's about four to six weeks. Um, and during that phase, they um, you know really reduce um, not all FODMAPs, but most um, to determine if they are FODMAP sensitive. 
Um, you know, and we find in clinical practice that about 50 to 75% of patients with irritable bowel syndrome are FODMAP sensitive and have improvement in their GI symptoms during that um, uh, initial uh, elimination or restriction phase. Um, and then the next phase, which is actually the longest phase, um, is the like sensitivity phase or um, reintroduction phase. Um, and this is also where there's so much variation in clinical practice. Um, but then um, patients undergo um, initial or kind of like segmental periods of time when they're introducing different groups of FODMAPs. So um, the first phase may be um, fructans, the second phase may be lactose, um, and so forth. And so you can figure out what one's own sensitivities are. Um, and, um, and, and so in the hopes of somehow getting to the, um, uh, the personalization phase, um, which is the last phase, um, where you kind of like are still able to enjoy some FODMAPs, maybe in smaller amounts, but you're not, um, uh, but not like probably not going back to like your total uh, normal diet that you were having before. Um, so the idea is that your symptoms may have be up here and then um, during the elimination phase, they may be here. Um, and then when you're going through the um, reintroduction phase, you're kind of trying things out. Um, in the end, you're still able to enjoy a lot of variety in your diet, um, but avoiding the types of fun maps that you know that you're sensitive to. So I think that kind of explaining that to patients, that entire um, process um, can be helpful um, in terms of adherence. Um, but yeah, certainly um, that is one of the biggest uh, complaints um, that we hear from patients in the office and, you know, not, not without reason. Um, it can be, it can be, um, it can be tough to stick to. Um, but I yeah, think that using the low FODMAP diet in conjunction with other therapies is often how we get around that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It is. It's, it's a, it can be cumbersome to, to comply with, but then, you know, conversely to that, if or when these patients get to that point in their, their treatment pathway that they can begin to reintroduce, even if it's in small amounts, some of these foods that were you know, so problematic for them before they started, you know, that's a huge win. It just empowers them that much more to maintain compliance moving forward. So, um, yeah, no, that's really helpful just to understand kind of how you explain it and what that discourse looks like with the patient. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I think my next question is, is along, uh, similar lines, because I think, uh, much like you were saying when, you know, you were in medical school, just kind of starting out in medicine, the idea of, of diet playing a role in the IPS, you know, care conundrum and approach, uh, was, was very foreign. It was not standard of care. It was not something that was, you know, front of minds of the practicing gastroenterologists. Um, I think the same can be said for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And this is an area that, that we at CDI obviously, um, you know, are, are daily, uh, involved in and, and, um, are having a lot of conversations about, but I, I've always, uh, I shouldn't say always, at, at least here recently over the past five or six years, I've, I've started to equate the idea of SIBO and its relationship to IBS in much the same way that I think H. pylori can be related to peptic ulcers. And for a really long time, you know, in the 70s, Barry Marshall was saying, hey, you know, active H. pylori infection is the cause of peptic ulcers and, and no one really believed him for, for quite some time. And all of a sudden, you know, that research got published, it got validated, it got revalidated. And that was the cause of, of these peptic ulcers, as we all know. Um, I'm not saying SIBO is the only cause of IBS. So I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm clear there, but um, there is a growing body of evidence that um, it could be a very significant underlying cause of IBS, at least in a, a sub-segment of this IBS patient population. You know, some of the latest studies have shown 40% all the way up to 80% of IBS patients may test positive for SIBO. So I, I'm wondering uh, kind of how you view the connection between the two, what you might recommend to providers who are treating patients with IBS like symptoms who uh, may or may not have already been diagnosed as, as having SIBO. Um, and, you know, I guess just to expand upon that personally, um, I've always taken a little bit of issue with the fact that there is so much ambiguity around this. I think that the two kind of need 
to be reconciled in some way, shape, or form. Some people call SIBO what really categorically can be diagnosed as IBS, and they call IBS what really categorically can be diagnosed quantitatively with a test of SIBO. So um, I'm just kind of trying to understand how, how you as a practicing clinician um, maybe distinguish between the two or if you do in the first place. Yeah, I think that um, your frustration um, between like the two sort of clinical entities um, is not isolated. I think that um, like patients have a lot of confusion about this and it's because the field is really muddy, um, mm -hmm. to be honest. Um, the symptoms of small bowel overgrowth and the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome, um, you know, they are like the Venn diagram is like this. Um, They're the same. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's really hard to divorce the two. Um, and, and I think that is because, I mean, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, I think it's all, uh, it, one um, is because one, the testing for small bowel overgrowth is problematic in itself. I mean, I, I send a lot of patients for breath testing um, for, um, with, uh, for, for a small bowel overgrowth, but, um, but, you know, one may still have a lot of symptoms that are very suggestive of SIBO, um, but have a negative test. Absolutely. Um, and then you also may have someone, if you didn't have any symptoms and you had them undergo that test, um, they may have a positive test. So sometimes it's a little hard to know, um, what to do with the data. And it's, 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 it's something that I'm wrestling with too. And I think that it's something that as we um, kind of, the field gets more mature uh, in this area, we're gonna hopefully um, be able to come up with how to use um, breath testing data um, in terms of um, how it represents like the clinical entity or like mm -hmm. you know, the, you know, the disease process. Um, and then of course you would wanna like parlay that into like what treatment options are gonna be best for that patient. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's there's so much um, overlap between small bowel overgrowth um, symptoms, which are often bloating, nausea, constipation, and diarrhea, um, and those are the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome as well. Um, and so I think that if you have a patient that you're wondering about that, or you have a patient who is wondering about that, which is something we see a lot in our in our practice, you know, um, there's no there's no reason like. I think that not to either treat them empirically um, for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or you know, have them undergo breath testing for that. Um, I think that you know, both of those clinical conditions will get, well, often will get worse with eating, um, especially with um, foods that are higher in carbohydrates. Um, and so you're, there's very, very little um, clinically that you can do to like distinguish the two. Um, I think that um, at this point, you know, there's no, nothing you can do without um, breath testing or duodenal aspirate that would kind of like distinguish the two um, because there's so much overlap. Yep. You, you went, I'll pick up exactly where you left off because you went just where I was going to, to go next is it, we understand that very fundamentally at CDI. We're the first to say that, that we know the breath test is not perfect. We're doing everything we can to try to standardize the criteria and approach that we use so it's conformed across you know all the clinicians that are are using our breath testing uh, protocol and and uh, pair that to the North American consensus. But we also know that that false positives and false negatives are are very real when it comes to the clinical diagnostic pathway of these SIBO patients and in many cases SIBO and or IBS patients. Uh, but we also know that the practicality of sedating functional GI patients and doing a jejunal aspirate on them just to determine if they have SIBO is, is uh, totally non-existent. It's, it's not going to happen. So what we are trying to do is offer a means to be able to diagnose a patient as having SIBO in accordance with other clinical data that the, the clinician may have, but we're, we're trying to be a supplement to the overall diagnostic pathway. We know the breath test is not what's going to diagnose the patient as having IBS quantitatively or SIBO quantitatively, it's going to be a component of that overall diagnosis that is totally up to the discretion of, of the provider. Um, and and I, there's a question in here, uh, which is, uh, I, I'm wondering about how that may or may not dictate treatment. So um, to your point about it being IBS, SIBO, potentially the same because the symptoms are so commingled, um, I'm wondering if there's any difference in your mind if you were to do a breath test on a patient and 
they have all the symptoms of IBS, but the breath test comes up positive, let's say. Um, and so now, you know, you're, in your mind, you're going to diagnose them as, as having SIBO and IBS, for instance. Would you potentially treat them using something different if you know that they may have SIBO and IBS or they're a, they're a kind of a SIBO segmented IBS patient, if you will? Like, does that automatically in your mind, are you going to go with an antibiotic, say a, a rifaximin or something of the like, as opposed to, you know, maybe dietary intervention or prokinetic or other motility agents? You know, I'm just, I'm wondering if that shifts the dynamic of treatment moving forward in any way. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a positive breath test absolutely does change my treatment recommendation. Um, you know, if you have a positive breath test for small bowel overgrowth, this is not an infection that is life-threatening. It's not like a cellulitis that you need to treat with antibiotics and let, you know, uh, like because of a fear of um, a local infection becoming systemic or you know, leading to sepsis. Um, and so one, explaining that to the patient, um, is, is sometimes like difficult, um, you know, to, to, for them to wrap their heads around understandably. Um, but, um, you know, explaining that it's more, not necessarily an infection, more like an imbalance, um, is, is, is usually, um, helpful. Um, and in terms of treatment strategies for small bowel overgrowth, I think there's, Unfortunately, not very many large or well done studies looking at the effectiveness of antibiotics in terms of treating small bowel overgrowth, especially you know, a comparative effect in, uh, effectiveness on trial. So we don't really have much that will say this antibiotic is better than another one. Um, but in general, um, you know, if I have a patient with a positive breath test, I'm at least discussing antibiotic use with them. Um, usually recommending it, um, letting them know that if they decide not to, um, at least for now, that's fine. Um, you know, we can just sort of see how things go. Yep. Um, in terms of antibiotic choice, um, that's often dictated by the type of small bowel overgrowth they have, um, you know, whether it's um, uh, methanogenic or hydrogen based. Um, but, you know, and generally it is involving at least um, some component of antibiotic, whether it's like rifaximin, a fluoroquinolone, um, and often dictated honestly by um, what, what's affordable and covered um, for that individual. Yeah, um, I think that there are some data out there, um, you know, that discuss the use of probiotics, um, herbal medications, um, and then also in those who don't want to go down the antibiotic route, um, using um, a low carbohydrate diet or a low FODMAP diet um, for, to, you know, to basically like starve the bacteria that are living in the small intestine a little bit more um, can be helpful. Um, but again, there's not a lot of, there are not a lot of data to support that approach, but it, it can be effective at least anecdotally. Yeah. No. And especially in, in knowing that these patients, you know, almost definitely will relapse at some point, you know, if you, if it's treated or at least under control for a certain period of time, the expectation almost always is that at some point, point in their life cycle, the, the symptom set will come back. So I think having that conversation with them on the front end and making sure they're as educated and informed about exactly what it is that's going on to your point, if they can do something to starve the bacteria, if they're uncomfortable with antibiotics at the outset or, or you know, some alternative approach is really important because that's something that they can take responsibility for over the rest of their lifetime. You know, if they know that's a uh, a treatment approach that may help to, uh, you know, eliminate some of the discomfort that they're having in real time. Um, it, it's important that they're informed of that. So I appreciate uh, all the context there, Dr. S. Warren. And I know we're, we're coming up on time. I, I want to thank you for your time today. Your insights were tremendously um, appreciated and, and helpful. I'm wondering, is, is there anything else on your mind, anything you want to share with, with colleagues or the community just about anything that, that you're seeing, clinical trends or, or otherwise, before I let you go? Well, I think that, you know, it's so interesting that, you know, in this post, hopefully post COVID era, um, you know, we've really noticed that patients' IBS has been crazily affected um, by the social isolation. Um, and now, as people are kind of moving back into um, social situations, that's also creating. Um, a little bit of panic in some individuals as well. Absolutely. Um, so many of my patients have told me during the last two years that their IBS has actually been better um, because they have more control of maybe what they're eating, 
Um, they're working from home. There's less like social anxiety. Um, but you know, some patients now is they're kind of like they're re-entering the world. Um, some of those triggers are coming back. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think it'd be, um, interesting to see kind of like what happens maybe like this time next year. Absolutely. Well, hopefully we can pick this back up and have another conversation, hopefully before that, but definitely then and see what the world looks like a year from now. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, thank you. On behalf of, of CDI, thank you to everyone listening and please follow us on, on social media for more GI community news and Dr. Eswaran. Thank you again.